Greetings, Internet, and welcome to this thing. Uh, I had 4,000 subscribers on my channel. Holy crap! So in order to celebrate that, I actually put a poll on YouTube and on Twitter and my Facebook pages and my Patreon asking what kind of video you'd like to help celebrate the 4,000 subscribers that we hit. We're actually over 4,000 subscribers now. And it seems that people wanted a Q&A, which is great. And then I asked for questions for the Q&A, and I didn't get a whole lot, which was confusing. Because a lot of people voted for Q&A. They like the idea of a Q&A, but they apparently didn't like the idea of coming up with questions to ask. All right. But some people did ask questions, and I'm going to answer them. I'm going to A your cues. Because, you know, I can. We're going to do this one first, because uh, it's a friend of mine, and he decided to ask a lot of questions, and, and some of them are ridiculous, so we're getting them out of the way. These all come from my buddy, Eclectically Sites. Having released three albums recently, what's the current status of the Insane Ian backlog? If those of you who may not realize this, uh, I've put out four albums in this year alone. One was a live album released a couple months ago, which was my live performance from uh, Fest 2019, uh, and the music video for the first song from that album I released last week on my channel, so check that out. Fest 2020, is this coming weekend, August 29th. By the time this, this goes out for everybody to see, it'll be August 28th, is the day this video releases for everyone who's not on my Patreon. So if you want to see these things early, haha, -ha, plug. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Fun Fest is this weekend, August 29th. I'm not really performing any songs on that, but I am hosting the Comedy Music Awards, for which I am up for one. Uh, I am the chairman of the awards, though, so <laughs> I, I go by the jurors on who, who wins. I don't just give myself an award. Uh, but that said, the awards are this weekend. A lot of great comedy songs nominated and also lots of great comedy performances. It's going to start at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, I'm mentioning that because the last live album I put out was from last. I also released three albums in July alone. Every two weeks in July, I put out an album. Uh, I released first my fourth B-side collection, which is called Demented Access Memory Nodes, or DAM, which actually has the distinction of having two of the first Insanian songs, or songs featuring Insanian, to have an explicit tag on them, other than the one song I did with Shoebox of Worm Quartet, which was on a previous B-side collection album, which was uh, math is bullsh... I'm not gonna say it on here. I can, I just choose not to. And then, the week after that, I put out... What was the other album I put out? Oh! <laughs> of course I forgot what it was. It was the Reviewsicles album, which took me six years to do! Yeah, so after six years, I did a Kickstarter for it, got the laptop that I still use now, editing software, capture card, which I use a different capture card now, a camera, I use a different camera now, but uh, six years ago I didn't have any of those things and did a Kickstarter so that I could do video game review comedy songs. And yeah, I don't know if you've noticed, I don't have a whole lot of videos of video game review comedy songs under the Reviewsicles name. The project kind of fell apart. <laughs> but after six years I finished it, my most recent song is a song I posted with Brennel Floss that got posted last month, and it just hit the fump this week, uh, which is the Funny Music Project. They post two songs a week for free under a Creative Commons license. That's what runs Fump Fest. Fump Fest is the Funny Music Project Festival. I'm over explaining a lot of things and not quite getting to his question. I do that. I ramble. This is why Shut Up Ian is a thing. And the third album I put out was the Ninja Sex Party tribute album that I produced. Uh, I'm on several of the tracks on the album, but I also produced the entire album as, as a whole. I organized the project, uh, got the artists involved, uh, let them know what songs were available, uh, got them to 
cover a certain song because some people weren't sure what song they wanted to cover and I'm like this song would be perfect for your style so I organized all of that and that is only available for people who backed the Indiegogo currently I'm working on trying to release that so that people who may have missed that project can get it but the question is after having released three albums last month and four albums this year what is the current status of the Insanian backlog I still have a ton of songs that I'm working on. Uh, I do a monthly song every month on my Patreon, where uh, the people who subscribe to my Patreon at the $2 level get a song every month, and at the $5 level get not just a song, but either a demo or a commentary on the track that was exclusive, or a commentary on one of the videos that I've done. So $5, you get a little bit more behind-the-scenes look at some of the stuff that I release. Uh, so I'm doing monthly songs there. I'm also working on a couple of things for the two fundraisers that the albums came out for. The Ninja Sex Party tribute album had a bonus EP for people who pledged at a certain level, and I am working on finishing that. And I'm also still finishing the backer songs from the Reviewsicles Kickstarter. Uh, because people pledged at a high dollar there and asked for specific songs. I've been working on those, trying to get those to those people. Uh, I also still have to mail out those albums, both for Reviewsicles and for Ninja Sex Party tribute album, uh, called Above the Covers is the name of the album. Uh, and I still haven't gotten the CDs pressed for Reviewsicles. It's been a hectic couple of months. Uh, and I'm also working on just regular Insane Ian songs. Uh, my Patreon is where a lot of the new stuff is going that is going to be on the next album, but I've also been working on things in between that. The thing I just posted to Patreon for July was the, one of the songs for the Ninja Sex Party EP that I'm doing. It's a cover of one song and two songs based on Ninja Sex Party that might be released outside of that EP. Um, but it's fun. Uh, but anyway, that's that. So my backlog is still pretty huge, as usual. Because I do too many things. Lee also asks, Do you perform at bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs? Not anymore. Um, I mean, I could. I don't really know how the crowd at any of those shows would react to my music. The last bar mitzvah I performed at was... Probably my own, technically. Uh, for those who may not know, when I was 13 years old, I was in an off-Broadway production called Bernie's Bar Mitzvah, where I played Bernie. Uh, it started in Maryland and then went to New York, and I've uh, been the Bar Mitzvah boy probably at least 200 times through all of the different performances. I missed one show out of the entire run, both the six months in Baltimore and nine weeks in New York. I missed one show and it's because I had a 104 degree temperature uh, and I had my understudy in and that was in New York. Uh, beyond that, yeah, no, I, 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 that was the last time I've done a bar mitzvah and that one was a stage bar mitzvah anyway, so I don't know if that really counts. Who are your favorite lesser known Marvel and DC characters? I'm a, I'm a big comics nerd, obviously. I like Spider-Man a lot, uh, big Batman fan, but as far as lesser known, uh, as in DC, I like The Question. I've been reading a lot of The Question lately. Uh, I picked up randomly at a Comic-Con. They had issues two through five in a free bin. Uh, the Denny O'Neill run. And I was like, I'm, I'll pick these up. And then I went on a hunt for issue one so I knew where I was starting. And I finally picked that up. And then when Denny O'Neill passed away, I was like, well, now's a good time to actually sit down and read these. And I read them and I loved them because Denny O'Neill was an amazing writer anyway. And so I've been picking up the new DC Black Label run of The Question, and I picked up some of the other random issues I could find, uh, and I've been enjoying that. And as far as Marvel characters, I was more of a Marvel fan than a DC fan, but I do still read some DC stuff. But as far as Marvel stuff goes, a lot of the stuff in the 90s. I was a big Darkhawk fan. Uh, I was a big Sleepwalker fan and uh, NFL Super Pro. I was not a really a fan of that. I just liked the novelty of there being a superhero named NFL Super Pro. Could you expound on your religious views through interpretive dance? 
No. Were there any other comedy musicians you were a big fan of as a child besides Weird Al? Well, as a child, uh, I didn't know of many other comedy musicians. Uh, Weird Al was kind of my first exposure to that. I didn't get a chance to hear the Dr. Demento show until I was in high school, because I, I didn't really know where it was being broadcast and didn't have a way of finding that out. So I, I didn't really learn about other comedy musicians until high school when I, you know, heard about all these other things that, that were on the show and that Al liked. And then I really got into finding other comedy bands. And, you know, the comedy section in the, the music stores was kind of a, a, an okay source for that. Uh, I would see artists like PDQ Bach and Tom Lehrer in there, but I wasn't familiar with them, so I didn't pick them up until after I started hearing them on the Dr. Demento show. And then any bands that had a humorous bend to them, I kind of really dug. Uh, friends in high school introduced me to They Might Be Giants. I got really heavily into The Presidents of the United States of America. They're my second favorite band after Weird Al. And so a lot of those were kind of like, hey, these are the things that Ian likes now. And uh, but, but, you know, when, when more comedy music kind of became a little bit more mainstream, it's really not mainstream at all, but like when you had like more larger name comedy music bands like Garfunkel and Oates and The Lonely Island and Tenacious D and stuff like that, when they kind of got broke out a little bit more, Flight of the Concords definitely, those were always kind of like big heavy hitters for me, but I also liked discovering a lot of the more obscure things, and one of the first kind of more obscure things, unless you're in a comedy music fandom circle, is The Great Luke Ski. The Great Luke Ski and Devo Spice, at the time known as Sudden Death, uh, were kind of my first exposure to, hey, these guys are doing what I do. I was doing comedy songs as masquerade snippets. Like, you know, at conventions you have a little masquerade where people come out in costume, and sometimes they perform a skit around the costume. Well, I would write a comedy song and build a costume around the skit. And I would just do it at the masquerades. I wasn't going to different conventions across the country and doing it. I was just doing it in Baltimore, where I was. And <laughs> then Luke Ski came to one of our commons in Baltimore. He was the musical guest. And I was like, this is a thing you can do? And I don't know why I was surprised by this, because in Baltimore, we had the Boogie Nights. And the Boogie Nights were a comedy band. But again, when I was a kid, the only comedy I knew was... Weird Al and Filk, because I was raised in Filk. And I'll get more into that in a later question, because I know it's coming. <laughs> Will you lend me five bucks? I mean, guess. When do you need it for, and when can I get it back? But that's all the questions from Lee. And uh, then we have a question from David W., Top three favorite video games you owned as a kid? That's a really good question. Uh, I played games a lot when I was a kid. Uh, I like video games a lot now because I played a lot of video games when I was a kid. I started on the, the TI-99, I think it was, that had like, you know, little educational games on it. And then uh, we went to the Commodore 64 and the Atari 400 800. My dad worked at a place called Video Concepts when I was a kid, and so he got all these game systems, and uh, eventually the I think we had an Atari 2600, and then uh, the NES. And I think I played the NES more than any of them, but uh, when I was a kid I played the crap out of TNC Surf Design on NES. Uh, I really loved Low G Man, which was kind of, kind of an obscure title now, not a lot of people really remember Low G Man, but I played the crap out of that game. And of course Mario Brothers. Uh, and Castlevania. Castlevania 3, Low G Man, and Super Mario Bros. 3 were probably the games I played the most as a kid. So probably those three. And uh, the next question uh, comes from... I apologize if I mispronounce this. Uh, Rice, V-R-I-E-S-S. -S. I've always meant to ask you how you pronounce that, and I didn't. And I'm sorry. But they ask, here are a couple. What was your first exposure to nerd geekdom, nerd slash geekdom that you can remember? 
Uh, as I alluded to previously, my parents were in a filk group. Uh, for those who don't know, filk is often described as the music of sci-fi or geek culture. It's basically in the 60s, people were playing folk music about Lord of the Rings and Star Trek and stuff. And they, rumor has it, had a sign at a convention that said filk music here. It was supposed to say folk music, but it was a typo. And then people went, oh no, the filk, the F-I in filk stands for sci-fi. So that's what it went to be. Um, so filk circles are kind of a big thing at conventions, and my parents had a group called the Omicron SETI 3, and they were moderately popular. Um, it was my father and my mother, and uh, often their friend Kathy and uh, their friend Russ, uh, and they would perform at conventions. We went to Canada, we went to New York, we traveled all down the East Coast, going to conventions and performing music. One of my earliest memories as a kid, six years old, watching my folks perform at a convention in New York was Isaac Asimov sitting in the front row singing along to my parents. So that was cool. Uh, that's actually in the liner notes of my first album because my mom is on my first album. We did a song from, from her group. It was a song naturally, one of the only songs in, the, in her repertoire that she didn't write herself. Uh, called the Captain and Miss Piggy, but uh, it, it's uh, it's one of the only funny songs they did too. My folks, my parents wrote serious songs, and I can't write a serious song if my life depended on it. I can only write comedy songs. I've tried to write serious songs, and they come out sounding corny as hell. So it's not a thing I can do. Uh, but probably, you know, because of my parents being Star Trek fans and you know uh, being in a filk group and. My mom wrote fan fiction, which wasn't just online then. There was no online. It was in things called zines, which were self-published little fanzines that people made. It, zine came from the word magazine, but they weren't magazines. They were just collections of stories. And sometimes uh, you got them in the mail. Mail fanzines were a little different than just straight up zines. Uh, Fanzines and mail, mail zines were mail, M A I L, uh, were, you know, things that you got through the mail that, you know, talked about, oh, here's some of the news coming through on this TV show and whatnot. And sometimes they had collections of stories in them. But zines were just, hey, you go to a convention, here's a table full of copyright infringement of us writing fan fiction about our favorite characters. Uh, <laughs> that was always fun to have stars of, of a show at a convention looking at a table full of fanzines going, what the hell is this? And then the dealer quickly hiding the Slash fanzines. If you don't know what Slash is, I'm not going to tell you. You have the internet, look it up. Uh, but yeah, my first exposure to geek nerddom was being born. My parents went to cons all the time because of what they did, and literally, I went to my first con in the womb. I had a womb with a view. I, I've been going to conventions literally since birth. When I was six months old, my mom would put my hand in the Vulcan salute, and that's how I'm able to do it so well nowadays. Um, when I was a baby, people would see me in the stroller or whatever, or the shopping cart in the grocery store, and say, oh, what a cute little boy, what's his name? And I'd say, Spock. At age three, I wanted to legally change my name to Montgomery Scott. I was raised in the faith, as they say. So yes, uh, since birth is the answer to that. And, you know, geek culture and, you know, my dad was a big Isaac Asimov fan, so he had all the books of that, and Robert Heinlein and stuff like that, and Piers Anthony, so he liked reading a lot of the fantasy and science fiction stuff. My mom liked Star Trek and a lot of... Uh, other science fiction things, so I watched a lot of, you know, <laughs> uh, Twilight Zone <laughs> as a kid, and I, you know, pop culture being what it was, and comic books, and it just kind of all like, this is how things are supposed to be. Geek Nerdum was kind of what my life was. Still is. They also ask, what are some unique challenges you have faced being a comedy musician? Um... A lot of my comedy music friends can corroborate this, but most typically comedy places don't know what to do with a comedy musician. 
you have sound other than you and a microphone. You have audio that is supposed to play. Sometimes you have a guitar. A lot of times you don't. Sometimes you just have backing tracks. You mean back in the day you'd have a CD that you would bring with your tracks and you'd give it to the sound guy and they wouldn't even have a CD player to play it. Uh, I usually run with a Zune, but I have a direct box that I can plug into just an XLR cable from another microphone so that, you know, it runs through the same sound thing. But sometimes, some clubs you have only have one XLR and one speaker. These are obviously not A clubs, so they don't really know a lot to, to do with comedy musicians. Um, but the other problem with being, you know, another hurdle as being a comedy musician is sometimes music clubs don't know what to do with you either. You know, you say you do comedy music, sometimes they just look at you sideways because they don't know what comedy music is. Do you play the notes funny? No, the songs, the lyrics are funny. You, it, it, it's become such a trope, but you have to kind of say, you know, like Weird Al, because that's the only reference point that most people have for what funny music is. So, you know, music clubs don't know what act to put you in front of. I get, I play a lot of nerdcore shows because there's a lot of overlap between comedy music and nerdcore because a lot of comedy music is funny stuff about nerdy subjects. So there's a lot of overlap there, so I, I tailor my show depending on what kind of venue I play, but that's usually the biggest hurdle is trying to figure out, you know, comedy clubs don't know what to do, or aren't set up for music, and music clubs aren't set up for comedy. So it's, there's overcoming a lot of that, but, and also just explaining to some people what the hell comedy music is, that's, that's always a, a challenge. What is the proudest moment you have had as a comedy musician? There's been a couple. I've, I've had a lot of... I've been very fortunate with a lot of things that I've done with comedy music. I had the number one song on the Dr. Demento show for 2015. Uh, my song, Benedict Cumberbatch, which was... I released a Greatest Hits album in 2015, and I had only done really one song that year so far. I did it in February. I put it on the album. and. Everything else on that album was like songs that had charted on the Dr. Demento show, but didn't get super high. Uh, and then, randomly, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch started being number one for the month. And it was number one for the month so often, it became number one for the year. So, <laughs> I randomly slapped it on that album as this is my most recent song, but it actually became the most popular song on that album. So that was kind of like a pretty big achievement. Uh, being nominated for a Logan Award. The Logan Awards are going into their 10th year. This is the 10th year of the Logan Awards. I've been nominated 10 times. Granted, I've lost 10 times, but... <laughs> well, I've lost 9 times. The ceremony is, is this week, but I, I don't have high hopes. I am the chairman. I might already know that. Um, but... <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had the opportunity of working with a lot of great people. Um, Weird Al has heard my music. That's already a great thing. The very first year of the Logan Awards, Weird Al was a judge. And he listened to all the songs that were nominated, which included one of my songs. I did a song called Our Love Song, which is me and my at-the-time wife, my now ex-wife, uh, doing kind of... I, I kind of likened it to a, a kind of Lady Antebellum song, kind of. Or Lady A, I guess they're called now. Unless... They're not called anything right now, because there was an actual artist named Lady A. I'm not getting into that. Anyway. <laughs> I did it as a style pastiche of, of that group. You know, it was us talking... It was been called the most realistic love song ever written uh, by a couple of reviewers, and it, it, it got to be nominated for Outstanding Original Comedy Song the very first year of the Logan Awards. And Weird Al introduced me when I came out to perform the song. It was a pre-recorded introduction, and I hadn't seen it before, but it's on my channel. Weird Al introduces Insane Ian. He says, I am now introducing Insane Ian. Achievement unlocked! Which is the name of another one of my songs. Uh, so that was always a highlight uh, and a thrill, and I sometimes have that play when I perform live. I have that clip play right before I come out and sometimes perform that song right after it. So that was kind of big. So yeah, I've had a couple of really nice, memorable, crowning achievement moments. Uh, I'd like to win a Logan Award. 
Oh, and uh, yeah, last year, uh, the song that was number one on Dr. Demento, I was a part of. So that was really nice, too. James L. says, where'd you get the idea for the name Insane Ian? The Dr. Demento Show. On the Dr. Demento Show, they had kind of originally, way back in the day, a cast of cast members on the show. You had Good Time Gil, Musical Mike, Whimsical Will does the news, still does it, um, occasionally, not all the time, but, but still does news segments on the Dr. Demento Show. And I liked the alliteration of those names, Good Time Gil, Whimsical Will, Insane Ian. I thought it was kind of cool with the alliteration, and it was kind of also paying homage to Weird Al. He's Weird Al Yankovic, and the first song I released as Insane Ian was Insane Ian Bonds, with Insane Ian in quote marks, because the hero worship wasn't obvious enough. Uh, later on, I dropped my last name from my stage name and dropped the quote marks, and it's just Insane Ian. Um, though sometimes, like on Twitter, it's Insane Ian B, because somebody already took Insane Ian on Twitter. Jerk. But, so I, I came up with that name ages ago, like when I was in high school, and then I started performing comedy music in high school kind of semi-regularly. I would write my own songs and stuff. I didn't have any ability to play them, so I would, like, have backing tracks, and I was telling my physics teacher, Mr. Caesar, about this, and I was like, you know, I'm going to be doing this as Insane Ian, and... Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, got these backing tracks and I'm going to play it. I'm going to sing along with, we're going to do it at this coffee house here in high school, which was basically just a gathering in the library. There's no coffee. We called it a coffee house. It was a little performance thing we could do. And he said, that's insane, Ian. And I went, okay, yeah, no, the name's going to stick now. So, uh, but yeah, no, I'd always been writing songs and trying to, to, to perform them. And that was really where the, the name really solidified was in high school. I would like make comedy tapes for friends of mine where I'd like do sketches and I had a karaoke machine so I would like do parodies on there and I've gotten a lot better. TU asks a couple questions. What do you think of junk lord YouTubers? Stuff like the wasteful content uploaded by Mr. Beast, Wava Juice, Collins Key, and others. Uh, I don't, I don't really think anything of them. They're not things that have come into my periphery. They're not really things that I've watched or even know too much about. I know Mr. Beast, I think, I think Mr. Beast is the guy who got a 20 year old Crystal Pepsi and drank it and vomited. And I think that's all his videos were, were just drinking old things and puking. So it's not really something that I watch in my day to day YouTube viewing. I watch a lot of YouTube. Uh, but, uh, so I don't, I don't really think anything of them. I'm, they're not, they're not something I watch. People enjoy them, and that's great if you enjoy that. It's just not for me. And last question came from TU. Do you have any musical experience before YouTube? If so, when did you start? I kind of sort of answered that a little bit in the, in the previous question from, uh, James. Uh, I'd been doing comedy music writing for a number of years while I was in high school, um, but I don't have any musical talent other than writing. I can't play any instruments. I, I don't know music theory, or I don't even know half the time if I'm singing a C sharp or a B flat or anything along those lines. I just know this is supposed to sound like this, and I'm going to try my darndest to sound like that. I can think of melodies. I can create melodies, but usually I work with people who can turn that into actual notes and songs. I, I have this uh, innate ability to surround myself with talented people who just make me look good because I have no actual musical talent other than writing and my singing is very debatable. I'm not a strong singer, but I've been doing it for a very long time. I've been doing it since high school. It's really weird because my parents have musical ability. As I've stated, they were, they were musicians. My mom played guitar and sang and my dad was a singer. Uh, my dad was an actor, which is how I got into theater and performing, and uh, he would do musicals, and uh, I would do musicals until I hit puberty. <laughs> and then I wasn't doing musicals anymore. It also didn't help that my high school just did not do musicals at all until the year after I left. And then, then he did Little Shop of Horrors. I really wanted to do Little Shop of Horrors. Huh. My, my best friend in high school got to play the role that I would have played, Oren Scrivello, DDS, the dentist, but... 
that's neither here nor there. He was he was a grade lower than me. Uh, but yeah, no, I've been doing music for a very long time. This version of Insane Ian, I've been doing for this is the 11th year I've been doing it. Technically, probably 12th year. Technically, my first song as this version of Insane Ian came out in 2008, which was Guitar Hero. Uh, and my first album came out in 2009, came out in March of 2009. So last year was the 10-year anniversary of that album. Uh, but 2008 was when I started doing stuff kind of more seriously as Insaney. And I'd been doing songs here and there, and I'd send tapes to Dr. Demento, but they were karaoke recordings, so they weren't great. This, and I'd been in a bunch of bands in, high, in college. Sorry, not high school. College, I was in seven different bands. Um, all of them comedy bands, and uh, some of the early stuff you can hear on my Bandcamp page. Um, but none of it's great, and some of it's a little problematic now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was an edgy 20 year old. I wanted to, you know, be funny and cool, and it, it's not a thing. But, uh, you know, I. I've been doing this for a while, and then in 2008, I, I hooked up with my friends Stettis and Ben Stahl, and they were both musicians in a metal band called Scoundrel in Baltimore, and I had an idea to do a song called Guitar Hero, which was a parody of, of Jukebox Hero by Foreigner, and Stettis decided to help me record that. And then after he recorded that, he's like, I'm too much of a perfectionist, this song almost drove me crazy. Work with Ben. Ben's really good, and he he won't go crazy trying to work on these songs. And me and Ben worked together a lot on uh, the rest of that first album and the entirety of my second album and most of the albums after that. He now runs a channel called I Make Mobile, where he does a lot of filming and music specifically on iPhones and iPads. Just, you know, how to do all this stuff on portable devices, which is really cool. So check out his channel. But yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't really have musical ability. I think of a tune, a melody, and I tell it to Ben, and Ben turns it into notes, and then the, turns that into a song. But I've been writing for forever. It's a long... I, I, I answer these really long-windedly. I'm sorry. But yeah, that's it. That's the Q&A. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. Thank you all for subscribing. Thank you for putting up with this kind of long-winded answered version, but whatever. Regular videos are going to continue next week. You know, more reactions, music videos. I do that every week, every Friday. If you like what I do, like, share, subscribe, comment. Please let me know some things that you think I would like to check out as far as comedy music. Uh, a lot of stupendium coming up because uh, I reviewed one thing and everybody went nuts and suggested things, so I appreciate that. Um, but, uh, yeah, and uh, more music coming, too. Uh, videos coming here, and if you want to check out all of those things early, plus help me make new music, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash insane Ian. Uh, but, yeah, that's all that. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Maybe I'll do it when we hit 5,000 subscribers. We're on our way. Bye.